Welcome, everyone. We're glad you, to have you back with us today. And I want to welcome everybody from Atlanta, our Atlanta location, and Dunwoody location, and Bremen, and Douglasville. Glad all of you are here today. And everybody that's watching with us, Church Online. Come on, give it up for everybody at Church Online. I, I, I know there's people watching from out of state. I also know there are people watching from other countries. We have a Canadian group that's watching with us. So all of you in Canada, shout out to you. Let's shout out to everybody who's watching from other places. In fact, if you're in another place outside of the Atlanta metro area, why don't you just type in the chat and let us know where you're from. We're really glad you're here. Well, you know, uh, Georgia is reopening some of their businesses and things are beginning to slowly reopen. And people are asking me, Pastor, when is the church going to reopen or restart? I like to think of it as relaunch. So when are we going to do that? Well, we're talking about it. In fact, we're, we're really um, seriously considering how to do it and when to do it. And I can tell you the priority is to make sure we do it in a very safe way. So uh, we've got meetings actually scheduled tomorrow. So I think the first of this coming week, I'm going to be sharing with you uh, if the, on a, with a video post. I'll communicate it through social media, uh, also online through our app. And so make sure you're looking for that. And we're going to be talking about when are we going to be able to gather back together, but do it in a safe way. I can tell you right now, we'd rather be slow and safe than to be fast and furious. So we don't want to do that. So we want to be slow. All right. So uh, last week, um, we talked to you out of Acts chapter 10, and uh, we were talking about Cornelius' house and how everything changed there for the Gentiles. If you missed last week, I hope you'll go back and listen to it. There's some really, really exciting things that happened for the Church of Jesus Christ at Cornelius' house. Now, here's the connection this week to last week's message. The idea that the Jews and the Gentiles were saved and they were water baptized and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what? It changed everything. But here's the connection. Then they went out and they served people and they took the gospel of Jesus Christ to, to, the, to the whole planet. In fact, in Acts chapter 17, it says that people were saying these, these Christians are turning the world upside down. And they did that because Jesus had touched their life. And as they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they went out to serve people. Here's what we know. And I think it's also during this COVID-19 period, I think it's just something that's at least at the top of my mind. And here it is. When the world is at its darkest, the church can shine the brightest. Man, when the world is at its darkest the church can shine the brightest. And that's happening today. The church of Jesus Christ, we are on the move because people are using their gifts to serve others. And I love what I'm seeing. In the book of Romans, if you have your Bibles, I hope you'll turn there with me. And if you have a notepad or an iPad or something to write down some notes, I'm going to give you some, some, some significant information, some seven different things of how we can serve. But if you have your Bibles, Romans chapter 7, it, it talks about a specific gift, actually multiple gifts, but one specific gift that's kind of an overarching gift that kind of covers all the other gifts that God gives by grace. Romans chapter 12, verse 3, it says... For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. In accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So we all belong to one another. And so we, we have different gifts, Paul writes, different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. So that's why I like to call these grace gifts. They're different gifts given to us according to the grace of God that's given to each of us. And then he goes on to say, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's encouragement, then give encouragement. All right. If it's giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. Be a leader. Give leadership. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Those are all gifts given by the grace of God. Now, 
in my Bible, when I get to that point, there's kind of this sectional divide, and, and most of you have it in your Bibles too, when it gets to certain different sections in the chapter, there'll be a kind of a heading to describe what's coming next. And in my Bible right here, it says, love in action. So it says love and action, and then it gives us the rest of this passage about these, these uh, serving gifts. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Somebody say faithful in prayer. Type in the chat, faithful in prayer. And then it says, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Now that, my friend, is love in action. Love in action. And this is what I want you to hear today. The one grace gift that is overarching is this gift of serving. Serving, it, it, it covers all the other grace gifts. Serving, serving others is love in action. Love in action, every gift involves serving others. If you're a follower of Jesus, then you have been given a gift to serve. Now, I don't know about you, but, but I like receiving gift cards, but I also like giving gift cards. You know, they're big business these days. I mean, Gift cards are, are huge, and there's multiple reasons why, and I think the first one is it's just easy. It's really easy to give a gift card because everybody loves gift cards. In fact, uh, it's easy to purchase a gift card. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to go in and decide what they want. You're just going to give them a gift card. Let them decide what they want. You might decide on a restaurant gift card. You might decide on a clothing store gift card. It might be uh, just a a Visa or an American Express gift card, so you're going to let them choose what they're going to get. So, so people love it. It's easy. They love to receive it. They love to give it. But also this, companies love gift cards. Do you know why companies love gift cards? Because <laughs> a lot of you don't use them. <laughs> I mean, people will buy them. They'll pay for a $50 gift card and give it to somebody, and then somebody will put it in their drawer and not use it, or they will use part of the gift card and not use all of it. Come on, be honest. How many of you have ever received a $25 gift card or a $50 gift card and you left a little bit of balance on the card and you never used it? I mean, maybe you used $46 out of the $50 and it's like, ah, you know, there's not enough on there to go buy something else and you don't use it. And the company's saying, thank you for putting money in my pocket or in our pocket. Here's what I want you to hear. God hasn't given you grace gifts, grace gift cards, so to speak, for you to put them in your drawer or for you to put them in your park or for you to use a little bit of it, but not use all of it. For the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about when everybody serves, when everybody uses to the fullest extent the gifts that God has given them. The first thing I want you to see is this, because here, this changes everything when everybody uses their gifts. Number one, I am created to serve. You just gotta know God created you for this. Ephesians chapter two, verse 10 says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God planned for this, God prepared this. That's good to know, but I want you to see how the translators gave it to us in the New Living Translation in verse 10, where it says, for we are God's masterpiece. Say masterpiece. Say, I am God's masterpiece. And he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. Long ago. Now, now, the word masterpiece describes our uniqueness. We're all unique. God has created you as a masterpiece. And the word masterpiece comes from the Greek word poema, which literally means a work of art. And it's the root word of our English word poem. A poem that you write that just comes out of your heart and your mind and your experience is a poema. It's a work of art. And the Bible says that's what we are. 
I'm a poema, a work of art to do what? To do the good things that God had planned for me to do long ago. So God created me to serve. He made me a masterpiece to serve God, to serve him in a very unique way to do the things he planned for me long ago. All right, the second thing I want you to write down is this. I am saved to serve. He saved me for this. God loves you enough to save you from your past and to enable you to fulfill the purpose that he planned for you long ago. You're saved to serve. You're not saved to sit and soak. We are not just to sit and soak in the hot tub of a local church. Is there anybody around me, anybody here that likes to soak in a hot tub? We don't need to go very far into that, but let's just, let's just say those, the hot tub can feel pretty good. And by the way, the hot tub of the local church, you wear your clothes, all of them. All right. So I'm just saying, but, but if I could just, if I could just talk about sitting and soaking here for a minute, it's okay to come into a local church and sit and soak for a while because maybe you've come in and maybe you've been hurt or maybe you've been disappointed. So what we're saying to you, come on in and sit and soak. Come on in and let the, let the hot water, the warmth the, the, of, of the family, let it, just, let it just help heal you. Soak your feet in it for a while. Sit in front of the jets and let it, mas- of the Holy Spirit, come on, the jets of the Holy, and let it just massage the pain and bring healing to you. But as you begin to heal and you begin to grow in freedom and you begin to discover your purpose, then you go and you make a difference. How? By serving, by serving. Listen, we are Chapel Hill Church. We are not Chapel Hill's country club. I mean, that's down the street and there's some wonderful people there. Charlie Moeller and his staff, they will serve you at the highest possible level. I love those guys. I love that place. It's a great place for you. But you know what? The local church, how much more should the family of Christ, how much more should we be eager to serve others at the highest possible level and not just sit and and soak, but be active in serving people? And I think this, I think COVID-19 gives us the greatest opportunity to say, you know what? I know we're sheltering place, but there's some things I can do from home. I can connect with people. I can serve people. And, and, as this shelter in place ban is is lifted and we can begin to go and do some things, I think we've got to find out where the greatest needs are and where people are hurting and where people are struggling, struggling and we go and serve them. Come on, can you just say amen to that? I mean, we need to be people who are ready and eager to serve. Get healed, get healed in the hot tub, and then come on, let's go serve. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 says, he has saved us and he has called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Jesus saved us and he brought us into his family so that we can link arms together, so that we can do battle against the powers of darkness and beat back the evil forces in our community and come together and pray against this coronavirus. There are things that we come together to do as we serve the Lord together in the name of Jesus. Church family in Atlanta, you are saved to serve, to do battle in the Atlanta area, in that East Point area. You are saved to serve and you're doing that. Church family in Dunwoody, you are saved to serve. Pastor Sam and Pastor Angie are ready to lead you to help serve your community. They're, help, they're, they're ready to help uh, serve, serve with you and, and take on w- with the mayor's initiatives and do the things that you can do there in that perimeter area. Church family in Bremen, listen, we're just getting started. We're just getting started. We are saved to serve that West Georgia area. And church family here in Douglasville, there is something for everybody to do. And let's continue to do it for Jesus. And when everybody serves, here's the point. When everybody serves, this changes everything. It really does. So I'm created to serve. I'm saved to serve. And number three, I'm called to serve. I'm called to serve. Write that down. Ephesians chapter four, verse one says, therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling for you have been called by God. 
Say that with me. I have been called by God. And maybe you would say, well, sure, sure, pastor, you've been called by God because you're a pastor. You're in, you're in full-time ministry. Listen, here's the deal. Yes, I have a calling on my life, but so do you. You've been called to serve. If you have made a decision to follow Jesus, then you have a calling on your life to serve others. Now think about this. Can you imagine the impact we could make together with everybody understanding their calling to serve? Think about it. On any given weekend, let me just tell you some, some numbers and the kind of impact that we could have. On any given weekend at Chapel Hill, prior to COVID-19 and, and all of us staying at home, when we would gather together on any, any given weekend, there might be 3,200, 3,000 to 3,200 people at all of our locations combined. And that, how many of you know that? That's huge. That's a, that's a lot of people coming together to worship. But that doesn't mean that's how many people are a part of our church family. That's just on any one given weekend. How many of you know we don't have everybody here every weekend? or at all of our locations. So that means, there, and the data kind of shows that there's five to 6,000 people that call Chapel Hill their church home. And, and that gets expanded out even further as we have church online. And now we have like nine to 10,000 people that are engaged with us on the weekend. And that's something to celebrate. That is, that's, that's awesome. Now think about this. Our, our active list, or list of active servant leaders and we, we identify who those people are, we know where they're serving, and we know their name, and we have the information. And that's about 1,200 plus people. 1,200, now there's a gap. There's a gap between the 1,200 and the 3,200, and the 1,200 and the five to 6,000. I, I praise God for the 1,200. That's awesome, but what if we doubled that? What if we tripled that? I've heard church experts and church leaders say, listen, you can only grow your church at the level you grow your servant leaders because it takes servants, it takes people serving to impact people and to touch lives. What if we quadrupled it? What if, what if we quint, quintupled it? What if we, what if we multiplied it and everybody would begin to serve? Listen, this changes everything. It changes everything. How many lives could be changed and impacted if all of us were using our gifts? How much hope could be found if we just went out as hope dealers? Yeah. Thousands of people. How many people could find fulfillment in their calling to serve? Let me take you back to the text from our first weekend of this series for just a moment. As Paul talks about the role of a pastor. He says in Ephesians 4 verse 12, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. I want to bring your attention to the word equip. Equip in the Greek means net mender. Pastors are to equip people to serve. Equip means net mender. So Pastor Jamal, you, you're a net mender. Net mender, Jamal. Net mender, Sam. And net mender, Angie. Netmender Brett, Netmender Andrew. I can't go through all the pastors, but we're all netmenders. What are nets used for? To catch fish. So, so nets are created with a purpose to bring more fish into the boat. So pastors are net menders to equip, to equip people that are broken, to equip people that are hurting, people who have lost hope, and maybe to mend the net of your life so that you can bring more fish into the boat. God has given you a net, a purpose. He's given you a unique design, and he hasn't put it on hold through COVID-19. We are net menders. We are serving people. We are helping people. In fact, it may be more needed now than ever. Yep. You know, Charles and Rachel Feneff have attended our church for many years, and they've served in many capacities just because they've had a heart to serve. Uh, most recently, they've had a small group. They've been small group leaders. Come on, all the small group leaders, wave your hand. Uh, put it in the chat. I'm a small group leader. We love our small group leaders. But they had a, a, a quilting small group for many, many years. So when COVID-19 hit, they were ready to pivot. How many of you know sometimes you just got to be ready to pivot and do, do something differently? And so I received an email from somebody in our church family last week, and they said, Pastor Dave, her name is Dee Dee. She said, Pastor Dave, I, I work for the county, and I've got a team of people that need face masks. We have to go to people's homes, and we need some face masks. And I just thought maybe 
maybe I could reach out to my church and see if somebody in my church could make some face masks. And my response to Dee Dee was, absolutely, how many do you need? It wasn't like, mm, I don't know, let me see if I can find somebody. I don't know if we, no, it was absolutely, how many do we need? I reached out to Charles and Rachel, and I said, Rachel, Charles, is it possible? Could you help us with some face masks? They said, oh, we're already making face masks. How many do you need? And I said, well, Dee Dee needs about 100. They made Dee Dee 123 face masks, serving people, doing whatever they could to make a difference at this time. So, so one person served 100 plus people with face masks. Look what Jesus did. Jesus took 12 people. He was an equipper, he was a net mender, and he was on the move with 12 people. But what could we do with 5,000 or 6,000 people that just says, hey, I've got a unique gift, I got some abilities, I've got some ways I can pivot, I can do some things that I'm not currently doing. We just all need to find a place to serve. So number one, we're created to serve. Number two, we're saved to serve. Number three, we're called to serve. Number four, I am gifted to serve. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received, which means we've all received a gift. Whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Listen, God has given each of us a talent or an ability. Here's what I've discovered. Some people are like, you know what? I, I just wish I could be a speaker, or I wish I could preach or teach, or I wish I could be a preacher. I wish I could sing like her. Or I wish I could play an instrument like him. I wish I could do that. And yet, and yet what they're saying is that the gift I've been given is not a, as important as hers or as his or somebody else's. But the reality is that all of our gifts are just as important as all the rest. People begin to believe that other people's gifts are more elevated or more important, but it's not true. Don't be jealous of someone else's gift. Our text said in chapter 12, verse 4, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. And by the way, if the gift God gave you isn't seen by others, you need to know that God sees it. I think sometimes we think it's not as important because others don't see it. I just walked by some people back in the kitchen today that are putting meals, putting food together for people on the weekend that we can serve food. You know, nobody's going to know they're in the kitchen today serving. I walked by and happened to see them. But I, I want them to know if you're watching, God saw that. God sees what you're doing back in the kitchen. And, and, and on Saturday morning, there's just a few maybe that are serving. God sees it all. He sees you when you're serving that young lady at PRC Medical. He sees you on that truck with faith and action. He sees you at CCC in Harrelson County. He sees you out there. He sees the kids and the families that you serve in Dunwoody. He sees you as you're leading an online small group. He sees you making calls to people and just encouraging them through this time. God sees you and when, when we gather again, he sees you. If you're standing behind a camera, listen, God sees that. We got people standing behind the camera today. He sees you. He knows you. He knows what you're, what you're, what you're giving to him today. He sees that. He sees you when you're serving kids and serving Chapel Hill youth and going into the schools. He sees that. No gift of grace that is used for God goes unnoticed. I want you to hear that. Let me just say this to all the single or single again people that are around here. Be careful. See, I don't think we should date or marry anyone that doesn't or isn't willing to serve in the church. Because if they don't serve in God's house, they're probably not going to serve in your house. Mm. If they're not willing to serve, they might not serve in your house. So be careful. You say, well, they, 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 they kind of serve. Listen, there is no kind of in serve. There's no kind of in serve. It's kind of like pregnant. You know, you either are or you're not. So, so, yeah, find someone who's willing to serve, who's giving it all they have. So look at this next one, number five. I'm commanded to serve. I'm commanded to serve. And let me throw this in, with an attitude. 
Now let's look what that attitude is. In verse 11 of Romans 12, it says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. The New Living Translation says, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Enthusiasm comes from two words, in theos or in God. Serve the Lord in God. Serve the Lord with enthusiasm. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 100 verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. Not sadness. Serve the Lord with gladness. And if you can't serve with enthusiasm, maybe you need to rehearse all the ways that Christ Jesus has served you. The psalmist did that. He rehearsed when he said, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, and he established my goings, and he put a new song in my mouth, and it's praise to my God. Listen, the psalmist just rehearsed what the Lord had done for him. Listen, when you rehearse what the Lord has done for you, you're ready to do something for the Lord and to do those things that he planned for you to do long ago. The right attitude is to serve whenever, however, wherever, to whomever. That's the right attitude to serve. You say, well, Pastor Dave, I'm a greeter and I'd rather serve at that door than this door because there's more people that come through that door than this door. There's 300 plus people come here on this door. There's like only three people that come in this door. Let me ask you a question. Which door would Jesus choose? I think Jesus would be very willing to go serve the three versus the 300. We need to serve with the attitude of Christ Jesus. That's a whole nother teaching in Philippians chapter two, but we need to have the same attitude as our Lord who took on the very form, the very nature of a servant to serve other people. Number six, my church needs me to serve. Yes, I'm commanded to serve with the right attitude, but I'm also needed to serve. We need people to serve right now. We need people greeting and praying for one another in the chat module. We need need people that will jump in and say, you know, I'm willing to serve, I'm willing to volunteer, I'm willing to help there. In fact, I think all of you could serve by doing that. We need people to help serve food. You know, we're serving food all over the Atlanta metro area at our locations. We need people to help do that. We need online small group leaders. We need you. We need you to say, well, I don't think I could be a small group leader. Oh, yes, you can. I was on, I was on a chat with some leaders in our church this week, and, and one, one, um, one of the men said, I've been on 10 Zoom calls today. The other one said, well, I got you beat. I've been on 11 Zoom calls. Listen, if you've been on a Zoom call, you can be a small group leader. <laughs> in fact, you can be a small group leader even if you haven't been on a Zoom call. But just getting on there and engaging with people and guiding people in discussion and, and sharing the scripture and just letting people talk about that and then praying for one another. Listen, we need small group leaders online. We need people that are trained and ready when we come back into this house or come back to all of our locations and begin to gather. We need people who are trained and ready in all of these areas of service so that you can be ready to serve serve people. And you may be needed to fill the spot of someone who's just not comfortable in coming back yet. When we regather, there might be some people that aren't, that are already serving, but they're not ready. So we're going to need somebody to fill their spot. We need people to serve for those who serve. All right. Romans chapter 12, verse seven, before we close, it says, if it is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. Come on, all the givers, give generously, he says. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. And then it says, practice hospitality. Here's the reality. If there are 500 to 1,000 new people at Chapel Hill when we restart or regather together, and I'm believing God for that and more, they're going to probably bring about 30 to 60 babies with them. We're going to need more people to serve. Right now, we couldn't handle 60 more babies. And there's just a lot of different areas that as we grow, we're going to need more people to serve. We need you. Your church needs you. And I believe this. I believe you need your church. And we need time to train you. So jump in, let us know that, hey, I'm ready to serve. Help me find a place and we'll help you do that. And then number seven, number seven, I will be rewarded for my service. What a wonderful promise we have from God. 
John chapter 12, verse 26, Jesus says, anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. The Father will honor anyone who serves me. Jesus doesn't say that the Father will honor the one who has their, ha who has their act all together. He doesn't say he'll honor the one who's never sinned in a big way or the one who has read their Bible from cover to cover a hundred times. No, that's not who he says he's gonna honor. He's gonna honor those who serve me. That's it, to serve him. You don't have to be perfect. You don't even have to really know how to do it or have a lot of experience. Just sign up and show up and serve. So we wanna make it easy for you. In fact, we're just putting a link right there in the chat that you can click on that link and, and let us know if you're ready to find a place and we're gonna work hard to find a place to help you serve. You maybe you just wanna email us, maybe you wanna to connect to somebody specific, but just let us know. Listen, you're not bothering us. We want you to reach out to us. We want to help you find a place. And by, by the way, I've mentioned a few Romans. Romans mentions a few different types of serving, but there's a lot of ways. Serving covers a lot of different areas. There's a lot of different places, not only in our church, but in our communities where you can get involved and you can begin to serve. My challenge for you is this. Just give an hour of your week or maybe start every other week. When we regather, just, we like to say, sit in one and serve in one. Just sit in one and serve in one. And if your location just has one service, then maybe you serve in that location every other week. But find a place to serve. You get to meet great people. You get to make great friends. But maybe the greatest benefit is this. Watch this. You will grow spiritually when you begin to serve. What would happen if everybody found a place to serve? There's no doubt in my mind this changes everything. Would you bow your heads with me right now and let's pray. Lord Jesus, <coughs> Lord Jesus, just lay it on our hearts. Lay it on our hearts to serve you. We are created to serve. You've called us to serve you. We are saved to serve. Lord, and I believe one day you will reward us greatly for what we've done in your name. In fact, I believe one day you're going to look at hundreds, thousands of people that call Chapel Hill their church home, and you're going to say, well done, thou good and faithful. You gave it all you had, all you had. And so, Lord, we just thank you that you're calling people right now. Holy Spirit, speak to hearts. Draw people to you. Draw people to a place of commitment that says, I'm ready to commit. I'm ready to, to sign up and I'm gonna show up and I'm just gonna make myself available. Help us to say yes to your call. And the gospel says this, that God became man in human flesh. He lived the life that we should have lived and died the death that we should have died in our place. On the third day, he rose again, proving that he is the son of God and offering the gift of salvation to everyone who would believe and repent and call upon his name. So maybe you're ready today to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and say, Jesus, save me. Put your call on my life. I want to be saved to serve you and to serve others. I want my past forgiven. I want a brand new start. If that's you, just click that button right there. It says, I'm lifting my hand. Or just to open your heart right now, wherever you're at, as we begin to pray. Would you just do that with me right now? Let's just bow our hearts before the Lord. Dear Lord Jesus, just pray that very simple prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe that you rose again on the third day. And you live today. You live forevermore. And I invite you, Lord Jesus, I invite your, your Holy Spirit to come into my life, to change me, to give me a hope, give me a future, and give me a place, a place to serve you, a place to give my life to impact others. Equip me, use me, and let my life 
bring glory and praise to you. Thank you for what you're doing in me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain, the salvation.